Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Leading the Remote AF Enterprise. Uh, thanks, Andrew, for joining us. Uh, over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Jadeep. Um, and uh, also thank you to Naresh and the entire Agile India 2020 team who've made this really easy. I'm loving this platform. It's really good fun navigating around. Um, and it's, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing where platforms like this go in the next 12 months because I think we're going to see some really cool innovation in that space. Um, yeah, hi to everyone who's out there. I can't see you, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to do some Q&A and I'll be able to see your faces towards the end of this talk. Um, I just want to draw your attention quickly to, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, the second last link that says handouts. If you wanted to grab a copy of the slides to take notes uh, while I'm presenting, you can grab a PDF in there. Um, there's also a, a image in there, which is we'll, we'll do a future perspective together at the end of this talk. Um, if you want to take that and use it in your organization or with your teams, um, then just grab that as well. So that's in the handout section on the bottom left hand side of your screen. Um, I'm going to start presenting now. Uh, just bear with me two seconds. What, uh, what, I, what I'll ask you to do, if you have any questions um, in the discussions panel on the right hand side, uh, put your Q&A in there and I'll try and answer those questions and then hopefully we can do a, um, a little bit of uh, sort of panel style Q&A at the end of the talk if I get through things quickly. Um, but I will. What I'll do. I'm, I'm very aware of how much fun it is to listen to someone on a uh, a, a VC call. So I'm going to try and get through this content as quick, quickly as possible. We'll do a interactive uh, exercise together, uh, and then hopefully we can have a chat. All right. I'm just going to present my screen now. Um, and yeah, today what I'm going to be speaking about is uh, Remote AF or the Remote Agility Framework. Um, this is a framework that we've created. Uh, we, we kicked the pro program off in February. We launched a mission team. Um, we, uh, we were very aware of the fact that, uh, I might, to, to give you a bit of an intro, I, uh, I'm a founder of a consultancy called Elaborate in Australia. We've got about 100 people. And it was a pretty stressful time for us looking at the numbers coming out of the pandemic and thinking about, well, how do we adapt to that as a consultancy? Um, one of the things that we thought would be really useful to the community was to take some of the ideas that we've got from 10 years of working uh, as an organisation and 20 years as individuals uh, with agile in distributed and remote and, and sort of hybrid organisations um, and bring those together into something that people can use to uh, help them navigate a new world. Um, the origins of this are probably at an Agile Australia event back in 2018, uh, where Simon Wardley and Dave Snowden spoke on strategy. Uh, so we had Simon talking about Wardley mapping and Dave talking about apex predator theory and Kinefin. Um And that kind of uh, helped us to understand that when you have a, a, a big shift like the pandemic, it has a tendency to accelerate things. And the reason for that is basically you have all this capital that gets poured into a problem space. So we've got financial capital. There's lots of money being spent on things like Zoom and, and money flowing in from the stock market to remote solutions. Um, but we've also got this massive intellectual capital shift uh, people are teaching their kids to learn remotely. Teachers are teaching remotely. Older adults are learning how to work remotely. Um, and because of that, something like remote working, which was probably previously considered a bit uh, a bit heresy, uh, and and something that you would not really be able to do in a lot of organisations of any scale, uh, that suddenly becomes something that uh, that's uh, more mainstream than it ever has been before. So, yeah, what we're trying to do with this framework is uh, provide the basis for organisations that are embracing agility to do it in a really effective way for the remote context. 
I'm going to go through uh, five steps in this presentation. So first of all, I'll talk about why we're doing this. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief framework intro. Um, the third thing we're going to talk about is leading the remote enterprise. So I'm going to go through a series of tools and uh, patterns and things that are in remote AF that help with that, uh, with, with help people to lead in, a, in the remote context. Um, then I'm going to get a, get you to do an exercise with me. We're going to do a workplace future perspective where we try and reimagine what work might look like in the future. Um, and that's an exercise that you can take with you, as I said earlier, and, and, and try with your teams. Finally, we'll do some Q&A. So without any further ado, uh, ado uh, let's talk about why remote is uh, something that we think is going to be really great. Um, so first and foremost, uh, there are a range of benefits that you can unlock with uh, with remote working. We know that you get reduced emissions from transport related uh, from transport related emissions, and that none of that would not be uh, more pertinent than somewhere like India, where um, there's so much traffic on the roads over there. Last time I was in Bangalore, I was just shocked at how much people movement there is in that city, uh, Beng Bengaluru, sorry. Um, so uh, the story I like to tell here is uh, Kathmandu. Um, there was a photo taken from Kathmandu earlier in the year when people were locked down because of the pandemic. And for the first time in living memory, you could see Mount Everest from that city just because the smog had cleared and the environment was a lot, uh, a lot clearer. Um, we've also got the opportunity to reduce urban sprawl. So cities are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and taking out uh, agricultural lands on the on the sort of outer rings of cities. Um, and we can reduce office waste. Uh, we've got a bunch of social benefits that we can unlock. Uh, I'm in a regional community in Australia. Uh, we're already seeing massive renewal in our community. We're seeing, uh, see, seeing parents out with their kids, um, my three-hour daily commute is now five minutes out to my shed, uh, and a lot of people are really enjoying being around their communities and getting to contribute to sporting clubs and to things like scouts and uh, and, and community things. So we, the, the regions are renewing. We've got more vibrant communities, um, and for countries like, uh, like India and also uh, more th sort of the uh, the more third world countries in the world in in Africa and and, and that kind of those kind of places we've got the opportunity to reduce the brain drain so you don't have to live in Silicon Valley to work in Silicon Valley remotely um, the, the the more that we can get this thing working the better better social impacts is going to be we'll have uh, the best and brightest staying in their communities, spending in their communities and growing their communities. Uh, finally, we've got the commercial benefits. So uh, depending on where you are in Australia, sort of talking about five to $20,000 per head to have a corporate office. Um, so there's a reduced cost. Uh, remote first organisations have always had uh, advantages in terms of access to talent. Um, you can you, the borders disappear. You can engage the best and brightest from anywhere in the country or the world, uh, and we're also seeing a lot of evidence of higher engagement in those organisations. So there's all these benefits to remote working. Um, if we can make it effective and sustainable, uh, but we've also got these challenges. So first and foremost, um, we've got to make sure that by by virtue of moving people into their homes that uh, organizations don't forget that they're responsible for sustainability um, for their employees. Uh, so we've got a lot of sort of um, really energy efficient buildings uh, in Australia. Uh, some households aren't as energy efficient. So there's, there's kind of, we've got to make sure that we don't just shift the responsibility for environmental sustainability off the corporate balance sheet and onto the personal balance sheet. Um, we've got some social challenges uh, in Australia um, and, and in a lot of the Western world. We've seen a rise in family and domestic violence. Uh, we've got a lot of people in rental environments or in places with uh, low internet uh, connectivity. 
um, or just not great spaces to work like uh, a lot of the people I'm, I've been talking to in uh, Southeast Asia, um, they just simply don't have space in their homes for a, for a desktop. Um, and finally, the, the final one there is cultural norms. So depending on where you're from uh, and what your gender is, uh, there's different expectations on you in the household. Um, and it's really important that we make sure that we recognise that not everyone has the same responsibilities at home and that we, we work around that a little bit. Uh, finally, from a leadership perspective, we're seeing, I speak to a lot of leaders who are talking about that loss of visibility, the loss of control, the loss of the water cooler conversations, the um, the decay of the informal networks that they use as a sensing mechanism. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of people that have been managed by people that just sh- sit on their shoulders. Uh, they've got that real learned helplessness uh, thing where they're waiting for someone to tell them what to do uh, and no one's there to do it. So I I suppose what we're saying with remote AF is we want to get the stuff on the top. The stuff on the top is amazing. But in order to do that, we need to make sure that the framework caters for the challenges on the bottom. And I'll I'll talk through a little bit how we tackle those. The second reason, um, the second primary reason why we'd like to go remote is that you've got an opportunity to design your life, uh, your work around your life rather than designing your life around your work. Um, this picture was taken in Lake Entrance. Uh, I'm not there at the moment, uh, but that's on the east coast of Victoria, the state where I live. Uh, I could conceivably be working somewhere like that uh, at least once a month or even more. Uh, when I was last in India, I visited Kerala. Uh, I visited Kerala and loved the beaches down there. Um, there's lots of places that are far better to live than big cities. Um, and, yeah, uh, this is a great opportunity for us to really redesign how we want our lives to be as we embrace, embrace remote working. All right. So I'm going to give you a very brief framework intro. If you want to talk about this in more detail, I'll hang around. I'll go into one of the uh, VIP rooms afterwards, but you can also visit the website www.remoteaf.co um, and you can register your interest there or hit me up on Twitter. My uh, my handle is AJ Blaine or the uh, Remote AF, which is just Remote AF Twitter. Um, lots of ways to get in touch. Uh, so just reach out and... We'll spend some time with you if if you've got some things that you're interested in learning about. This is the this is the I suppose the uh, we call this the crop circles diagram, but it's the high level framework overview. It shows you what's in here, and I'll probably go right to left here because uh, it's just easier for me. Um, we start at the team layer. Over the last decade, at Elaborate, we've Um, Look, I've done a lot of work trying to understand Kinefin and complexity uh, and systems theory and systems thinking. Uh, I suppose what at a team level, what things boil down to is that there is a lot of the the context and the nature of the work makes a big difference to how you organise to work. Um, and where we kind of landed is that there's these three core team archetypes. Um, we've got operations teams. Uh, many of us would have worked in an operations team at some point. This is not IT operations. It's, uh, it could be finance operations, people operations, marketing operations. Um, it could be a tech ops or a, a, an order handling operations teams. They're the teams that are the custodians for the revenue of the organization. They need to make sure that customer requests are fulfilled promptly, that uh, we invoice, that we bill, that cash is coming in and that we're running the business effectively. Uh, the nature of the work in operations teams is vastly different to the nature of work in what we call product teams. So these could be DevOps teams in technology. They could be uh, teams that are introducing change. They could be teams that are doing regulatory programs. But these are the teams in the organisation that are trying to understand where the organisation has to go, be it an initiative or a change or a new product, and they're working to implement that change into the organisation. 
So for an operations team, a lot of the work is just uh, unplanned. The demand is flowing in constantly. It might be spiky. It might be seasonal. For a product team, you've normally got a, a relatively good plan of where you want to be going. Um, and because of that, the, the, the how we organize, uh, how we work, um, the kind of things that we want to measure, uh, the tools and the patterns that we use uh, are necessarily different. The final team type here and the remote AF team, which we launched in February is one of these, um, it's a mission team. So it's it's a team that's working to strategy. They're independent. They've been given a mission and they've been told to go and autonomously solve that. Uh, and the reason we draw the distinction there is it's um, – it's really important that mission teams are unstructured, that they're led differently, that they're funded differently, um, all that sort of thing. So what we have is three core archetypes and then we've got uh, basically guidance on how you do planning for each of the three team archetypes, how you review, how you reflect. Uh, we've got a really nice pattern for launching teams and a pattern for health checks. In the centre of the diagram, then, we go to team of teams. So this is uh, General Stan McChrystal's uh, concept. Um, it's basically a team containing many teams, and that fractal concept. Uh, teams of teams, uh, I suppose, contain direction and, and uh, they, they look at what the, a group of teams should be doing in order to achieve larger slices of value for an organisation. And here are the patterns that we have. Uh, we have an all hands planning, an all hands planning uh, pattern, which is basically how do you take strategy or a big program of work or an initiative and break that out in a uh, in a virtual setting with remote teams. Um, we've got a virtual abayer, which is designed to basically visualize all the information that's necessarily necessary to effectively uh, lead and participate in that team of teams. Um, finally, we've got a pattern for reviewing uh, how our progress against our plan. And the two uh, down the bottom there, we've got uh, we've got an approach for how you design the teams that are in the team of teams. So it's, it's kind of what teams do I need to execute the objective that I've been given. Um, and we've also got a program or team of teams launch pattern, which is how do you take a range of teams and set them up for success. Finally, we've got patterns at the enterprise layer. Uh, so we've got an approach to strategy. Uh, again, we've got a virtual abayer. Um, an abayer room is, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, a little bit down the track, uh, but it's basically a visualization of critical information for decision making. We've got an approach to scoring the strategy and how we're going to against it so that we can make interventions. And then we've got uh, a few things down the bottom there. So first and foremost, uh, you can't just take your existing operating model, move into a remote or a hybrid environment and pretend that it's going to work. You can't lift and shift someone else's operating model. Um, there's a lot of organizations kind of taking the Spotify model, which isn't a model, and rolling it out in their organization at the moment. That doesn't work. Um so this is an approach for designing a fit-for-context operating model that respects the constraints that your organisation has. Uh, we've got a pattern for remote governance. Uh, there's a lot less visibility of the, the physical work in remote and hybrid organisations, so we need to make sure that governance, uh, that, that, that we govern the system effectively. And finally, the area that I'll be focusing on today uh, patterns for leading remote enterprises. So you can kind of see there's a there's a whole lot there. We've designed the framework as something that sort of uh, it's it's not meant to replace agile frameworks. It's meant to be a remote layer that sits on top of agile frameworks. Uh, and the other thing is meant to be modular. So if if all you need to do is plan with a bunch of teams how you're going to solve an objective, you can just pick up the all hands planning module. If you just want to design a remote or hybrid friendly operating model, you pick up the operating model design pattern. And basically the way that we're uh, rolling this out is that there's a range of training courses. Um, we've, uh, we've got a bunch of guides who are going through an early adopter program. 
at the moment. Uh, one of those is Manoj Khanna, who's uh, uh, who's servicing the Indian region. So, yeah, if anyone's keen to talk to Manoj about what his plans are, I can make that intro as well. Uh, all right. So now let's get into the meat of this presentation, which is leading the remote enterprise. Um, I'm going to anchor this around... Uh, a very simplified version of uh, Wilbur's all quadrants, all levels, um, the integral framework. Uh, basically, what Ken talks about is that you have f four dimensions and that people tend to focus on the bottom right here rather than focusing on all the things that you need to improve leadership in an organisation. So first and foremost, you need to be able to lead yourself you need to be able to recognize the patterns that are holding you back as a leader and you need to be able to actively disrupt those patterns where, when they're getting in, you into trouble. Uh, secondly, you need to be able to lead, lead your team. So you need to show up as a leader, be effective, have the hard conversations, create an environment where people flourish that's contextually appropriate to the problem that they're trying to solve. Uh, you need to lead together as a team. So you need clarity, consistency of message. Uh, you need to be able to argue as a leader, leadership team uh, and, uh, and and forge a, uh, a, a direction that you all agree on. And then you need to hold in behind that direction and really kind of commit to it and be accountable to what you've said you're going to achieve. And finally, we got the idea of leading the system. So this is how we work, what our operating cadences are, what our hierarchy looks like, um, who reports to who, how we measure things, KPIs, system measurements, all that sort of thing. And what we're finding, uh, speaking to a lot of leaders, is that there's uh, an awful lot of fatigue in the leadership community. Um, a lot of people are finding that they don't have the tools to do some of the harder parts of leadership, and that's what we've tried to solve here. So I'll walk you through some of those. Um, leading yourself, now, uh, what I will point out is that there's not much that we can do with a framework that's going to be better than some of the really great tools that are out there for helping you to understand other people's perspectives on you and work out how you're going to adjust your behaviour over time or kind of work through becoming a better leader. Um, I recommend the Leadership Circle, which is Bob Anderson's tool. It's a fantastic tool for getting feedback from your team that's actionable. Um, what we do do in Remote AF is give people a lot of guidance around personal productivity. So how do you set your home up? How do you get your ergonomics right? Um, how do you build really good habits uh, so that you, you're doing time and task management well? How do you keep yourself um, in a uh, in engaged and 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 fit and well state um, and those sort of things and we've also got the idea of these story me cards which are a little bit of a window into people um, to make onboarding easier and also to sort of reveal to people a little bit about yourself so this is my story me card um, you can as you can see if you didn't know anything about me. And this is really critical in teams. I've worked with a lot of distributed teams um, in India, in China, in uh, the UK, uh, in the US, um, and in uh, in the Philippines. Um, what you don't tend to know is you, d you don't really get a window into who your teammates are. So what we're trying to do here is just give people something that they can reveal as much or as little about themselves as they'd like to, uh, and you, it enables you to kind of go, oh, where do I want to have a conversation here? So from for me, I live in the Macedon Ranges. I've got uh, my wife, Nis, my two kids, Jasper and Evie, and my beautiful Kelpie, Nelly. Um, on the right-hand side at the top, you can see what I do at work. Uh, bottom left, uh, I am a winemaker. Um, so I've got a little winery down the road, and we buy about 20 tonne of grape in and, and make some really nice Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, and then there's a little exercise in the bottom right, which comes out of Robert Keegan and uh, Lisa Leahy's book, uh, An Everyone Culture, uh, which is kind of showing, getting leaders to show people that they're working on stuff as well. 
So I can re- I can rely on myself for strategy. I can rely on myself for optimism. I can rely on myself learning things quickly. Uh, but I, I need to work on making sure I stay focused, so not chasing squirrels. Squirrel. Uh, optimism can be as much a uh, an advantage as a disadvantage as a leader and also need to watch out for inconsistent energy levels. I can go at a million miles an hour, but then I can fall in a heap if I'm not really monitoring how I'm managing my energy. So you can kind of see how this is something that uh, – allows people a window into their leader um, and and also starts to create that environment where vulnerability is okay and you can um, and people can see that work is not a place where you have to be per- perfect you shouldn't have to hide your flaws you should be uh, open about your flaws so that uh, so that other people can help you work on them so the second part of Wilbur's model is uh, leading teams. Um, what we're going to talk about here is basically how do you take what you're intending to achieve and make sure that that gets down to the teams. Remote teams are really effective if they've got bounded autonomy. Um, so teams that were already doing agile, had control of their backlog, or working through things, um, they moved into remote working relatively easily. Uh, it's the teams that get their work handed to them, get sat on their shoulders and that kind of thing that really struggle. So in Remote AF, we, we, we've built a whole bunch of stuff to enable you to take strategy into planning and then down into the teams so that the teams can work out what actions they're going to do. Um, and we've also built a range of metrics advice uh, based on uh probably the last five years we've been working on this stuff. So how do you observe the system effectively from a data perspective so you can see the flow of work through the system? And then as a leader, you don't have to sit on people's shoulders. You, you know where the place that you need to intervene, the, the place in the system where you need to interrogate is, uh, which is a, a, a very different way to look at a system. So this uh, these... Um, Miro boards, which were basically built up, but they'll work in any digital whiteboard tools, uh, are basically things that help you to do that as a leader. So you can articulate the long-term and and more visionary aspects of your strategy. You can explore um, where you are and what movement there is in the system that you need to be aware of. Uh, You can define your long-term strategic planks, so the things that are... uh, they, they challenge the possible. They should be really hard to achieve. And then you use OKRs to take those down into things that can go into the teams and then come back up in a bi-directional fashion so you get the, the back brief that shows that people understand um, and, are, and are committed to be going where you're going. We also have... Uh, let's show this quickly. Um what you can see here is a bunch of teams across a 70 or 80 person program uh, who are taking a telecoms, uh, a large telecoms transformation program and using the all hands planning uh, pattern in remote AF to bring things into, um, into, a, into a group plan. So yeah, uh, similar to big room planning, but conducted remotely, uh, it's a really good way to get everyone aligned and make sure that you understand as a leader what's happening, where the constraints are, that kind of thing. Um, we've got leadership team launch canvases. So these are how do you, it's a it's a process for launch launching or relaunching your leadership team in the remote context. Um, thinking about how how you're performing as a team, what demands are on you, how decisions are going to be delegated. Uh, how you measure performance, um, going through a process of building a team alliance and uh, working out what behaviours you're going to accept, um, looking at when you want to work, when you want to uh, when you want to get together, um, and also how we're going to communicate with ourselves and with the broader business. So this is a pattern for launching or relaunching um, the team, uh, which is, I forgot to mention, we're in Wilbur's leading together quadrant now. So this is the, the leadership team working together. Um, we've also got the 
uh, virtual abaya. Um, an abaya room is something that we use uh, prof profusely as part of the engagements that we do as a consultancy. It's a room where you have all the information that's necessary to uh, to make great decisions. So the virtual abaya in remote AF, um, I'll show you some of the patterns that live underneath. Uh, we've kind of got uh, we've got data. The, the, the key data pieces that we need. We've got connection to strategy. We've got connection to plans. Um, we've also got team agreements and story, me, story, us cards to kind of hook everything together um, and make uh, and make it really easy for people to see what's happening, where things are and, uh, and, and where things are going. Uh, there are some really good uh, tools out there that support this. Um, we're really liking where a lot of the uh, the existing tools are going as they're getting investment and really pushing into uh, this this remote future. Um, finally, we've got leading the system. So I won't go into this in great detail. As I said, you can come and have a chat to us and we, we, we'll show you around. But um, the core thing here is making sure that you sit down and work out, all right, I've got all these new constraints. I can't do the things that I used to do. So how am I going to design my operating model, my operating cadences, governance, leadership, all those things? How am I going to design them differently so that I can make the most of this new situation? Uh, and that's that's the operating model design and the and the remote governance patterns. So yeah, you can start to see how, from a leadership perspective, if you're leading an organisation that's remote or hybrid or or um, or planning on being remote or planning to go hybrid, there's a whole range of stuff in the framework that'll that'll help you with those problems. What I wanted to do now, though, um, is show you a little tool that we like to do before we do operating model design. And this is a workplace future perspective. Uh, so it's, a, um, it's basically something that you can do to think about where you are where you want to go. Um, the basis of this is the futures cone or the cone of possibilities, which was uh, work of Herman Minkowski. Um, he was one of Einstein's teachers. Uh, it was introduced to us by Eladad Hamidi via Jay Bloom, who I think presented on this at DevOps conference a few years back. Um, Basically, humans can get a little bit stuck when they're trying to think about possible futures. We, we kind of get locked into what's immediately visible to us. Uh, so the future perspective is designed to try and take you out of that constrained thinking and get you to think a little bit, uh, a little bit more into the future. What I'm going to do, um, I will stop this presentation now. Um, and what I'm going to pop into the discuss on the uh, right hand side a link. I'd like you, if you can, to jump into the Miro board. So this is in the audience public section of discussions on the right hand side. Uh, you'll see the Miro board, and the password is remote colon af to that board and then I'll bring the board up. All right, good. We're starting to see some people appear here. I'll just bring you all to me. So as I said, this is something that you can take from this talk and you can use with your teams. I'm going to go through it very quickly. The instructions are pretty clear. Um, so, uh, yeah, you should be able to take this and run with it. I'll just give it a couple more minutes to make sure that we've got everyone. Okay, you can see that now. So... If we move in, how do we how do we run this? Um, so how do the the problem statement for this exercise is how do we make the best of now 
and then purposely evolve towards a more productive, flexible, engaging, sustainable and equitable approach to work. I'm going to bring everyone in to the current state. And for those who have joined us in the Miro board, um, I'll bring you to me. What I'd like you to do is on the left-hand side of the Miro board, you should be able to pull some sticky notes in. I'd like you to think about your current state. Um, use a green sticky note for something that's, that you're really liking about your, your current situation. Use a pink sticky note for something that you're not liking about your current situation and kind of think about these eight lenses. So what's life like at home? What's like life like at work, um, in your community, uh, your personal well-being, um, equitability, safety and sustainability oh, and risk. That's the eighth one. The black monotonous, I like that. <laughs> All right, so we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this, but you can see how you can start to get some really good uh, some really good insights into how the current state is, um, which is really important. Uh, so things like if you're a leader and you're seeing people say, think, say things like monotonous and stuck and, and that kind of thing, risk of getting COVID-19, it's an opportunity to really empathise with people um, and try and... Uh, try and understand how you can create an environment that's better for them. The, the worst thing that you can do in remote working is take all the things that you used to do in your physical workspace that were designed around the constraints of being in a building, uh, having a set of rooms that you can use, um, having floor space in a certain configuration, and just roll all that stuff into the remote environment um, Meetings need to change. You need to rethink the way that you do things with remote at, at the heart of it. So if we then scroll over, um, I'm going to bring you across. What you then do with your teams is ask them to project forward. So basically say, if nothing changed about the current situation, so if we did nothing, what mess do you think we'll get in? Um, so what, what problems do you foresee? And you can challenge them with a few questions around the edges there as they fill things in. So I'll get you to start bringing in some sticky notes now. But as people are doing that, you, you might challenge them as a leader or a facilitator by saying, is, is the mess stable? Will it improve? Will it get worse? Um, are any of these problems related to each other? How are they related? Why are they related? Um, you might also start thinking about uh, more of a, a, a larger systems view. Uh, so are there powerful external agents acting on the system? We're already starting to see in some places that there's a big push for people to return to the city. Um, the reason for that is there is a lot of money tied up in corporate real estate and in retail in the city and that kind of thing. So we, we will see as things start to move forward um, that there will be uh, there'll be a big push to get people back into town into, into the city great all right so once you've done that we then ask people to take the shackles off and we ask them to move out to the outer edge of this exercise and just say, what would an ideal future look like? So if we just got rid of all the constraints, if we just said, 
let's do this differently um, and build a workplace that is perfectly suited to where we want to go, whether that's fully remote, whether that's hybrid remote or something in the middle. What might that look like? Again, I'll get you to bring th some things in there, um, but it might be something like uh, I'd like to be at work one to two days a week. Um, I'd uh, I'd like to live somewhere a bit further out of the city, closer to my family um, or closer to my hobbies or, or something like that. Um, I'd like to make sure that uh, we are subsidising our employees um, or paying for them to have ergonomically safe uh, um, work tops. Uh, I'd like to have a series of hubs, so maybe not a big corporate office. Maybe it's uh, a series of hubs uh, that are closer to regions, that kind of thing. So yet, yeah, uh, just uh, whoever's put that water cooler chats in, I'll, I'll move that out to. We're just in the in the purple circle now. Good. I think everyone's getting the hang of this. Um, so then, finally, we then ask people to go. All right. Well between that ideal future and where we are now, there's a more plausible future. So how about we start to look at what's plausible in our context and then look at what interventions we're going to need to make in order to take us closer to that ideal future. Um, so you can kind of see how the exercise focuses you in on the now, uh, makes you cast forward to see uh, the issues with not acting then resets you to think about uh, something that's ideal and utopian before bringing you back to something between current state and, and reality. And through this, you can have some really good some really good conversations on, about the kind of workplace that you want to create and what's what that's going to take. Um, you can do this at a team level, at a at a group level, or at an organisational level. So we'll close that off now. Um, as I said, if with your own organisation, you can go into the handout section and you'll find a copy of it to chuck in your own digital whiteboard, whether that's Miro or Mural or, or um, Atlassian or, or Google or whatever, whatever you're using. You can hit me up. Uh, on Twitter, AJ Blaine. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can uh, visit the website and make contact with us via that means. Um, so plenty of ways to get in touch. Always happy to talk about this and um, uh, and and talk about how we can make this work uh, in the future.